Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. This is Morteza Hajizadeh, your host from Critical Theory Channel. And today we are honored to have Professor Renz Bott with us. Uh, Dr. Renz Bott is a professor of digital humanities and the history of humanities at the University of Amsterdam. He's also the director uh, of the Center for Digital Humanities and the director of the Wusia Center for History of Humanities and Sciences. And today he's here to talk with us about a wonderful book he wrote in 2013 called A New History of the Humanities, The Search for Principles and Patterns from Antiquity to the Present, published by Oxford University Press. Renz, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you. Pleased to be here. It's customary to ask our guests to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their field of expertise and how they became uh, how they became interested in in their area of uh, research, which is humanities in your case. So tell us a little about yourself, please. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, actually, I started out studying a very different field, astrophysics, in 1983, a long time ago. Um, but at the same time, I also realized I wanted to combine, let's say, the sciences and the humanities. I had already had that feeling at high school. So I did secondary um, uh, subjects in, 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 in linguistics, which is a humanities field in Western Europe. <laughs> it's not everywhere the case. <clears throat> I did uh, stuff in art history um, and also philology. Um, and then after some time, I decided I really wanted to move from the sciences to the humanities for a period. I went to study in Italy, in Rome. And surprisingly, I figured out, hey, there are many beautiful books on the history of science, but very few books on the history of the humanities as a general field. And I noted that absence somewhere in the late 80s. I talked about it to several people, um, very famous people also in the field of history, like Anthony Grafton from Princeton University. But basically, everybody told me such a book cannot be written. And that was actually kind of a wake-up call for me because I said, but wait a minute, if there are general books on the history of science, why are there no general books on the history of humanities? It's not that we have to be always... To, to, to dive into, let's say, the original, let's say, um, um, uh, sources to write such overview books. So I really needed um, a kind of um, overview for myself. And later on, when I went on in academia, I also noted that uh, my students, who I taught basically had digital humanities, which is one of my uh, fields here, which, which actually combines this combined interest in science and humanities. In the field of digital humanities, also the students are basically, you know, uh, entirely... Um, 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 how could I say, flabbergasted by this enormous broad field of humanities. And rather than just focusing on one specific field, literature, I thought we need to introduce them to the humanities in general. And the best way to do this, and I still am convinced about this, is by explaining how these humanities have come about. So providing them with a kind of um, um, historical overview of the humanities. And this is actually how I got into this field, which is actually a relative new field, a relatively new field, the history of the humanities. Yeah. Oh, it makes perfect sense when you said, I didn't know that you studied science. You start with science. Yes. And, and now you're doing digital humanities. So it, I guess it's <laughs> it quite makes sense. Uh, so can you tell us, well, you brief, you did mention how the book came about because that was my next question. And you're quite right. There are not really a lot, of, a lot of books on the history of humanities. And I myself always thought about it as a very difficult area because it's so broad. Um, we'll get into that uh, a little bit well, later on. If yeah. you want to write such a book, yes, yeah. <laughs> you do need, and you, I, I do like your pat, your, your 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 approach, which is principles and patterns, which uh, are, which I'll ask you now. Actually, can you tell us about the structure of the book? Because I find it quite interesting. You choose several, um, let's say, disciplines, and then you study them in different time periods. So, can you, for for the benefit of our audience, can you briefly define humanities and talk about the structure of the book, and then we'll delve into more details. Yes. Yes, indeed, it's a beautiful question because these were also the initial questions I struggled with myself. So how am I going to limit such a book? Should I limit myself to Europe? That was the first question. I said immediately, no, I want to try, at least to try to come up with a more global approach. Also because, and I'll explain that later, there have been so many interconnections, so many, let's say, um, uh, knowledge circulations uh, that it's impossible to limit oneself to one uh, uh, region. So I, I wanted to have a global approach. But then what disciplines have to be included? So in other words, what are the humanities? And then you can immediately immediately discover that there are many different definitions uh, of the humanities. Even 
even between, let's say, Western Europe or Europe in general and the US, uh, Northern America. For example, I just mentioned, I previously mentioned the word linguistics. In most Anglo-Saxon countries, it's seen as a social science, whereas in Europe, it's seen as a humanities discipline. So I said, "Mm, is there a general definition of the humanities? Actually, there is no good definition. One could say certain disciplines like philology, art history, or part of the humanities everywhere in the world. But these are just, let's say, some of the core literature as well, of course, some of the core disciplines, let's say three that we find everywhere. And then I started out with a well-known definition of the humanities, uh, which was introduced by the German philosopher uh, Wilhelm Diltai in the late 19th century, who said that the humanities, I'll translate it into English, the humanities are the disciplines that study the expressions of the human mind or the productions of the human mind. It depends how you define how you translate the word, but um, so so the humanities are the, uh, the, the 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 disciplines that study the expressions of the uni- human mind, like uh, uh, literature, like art. We express ourselves also via language, so linguistics is in there, um, music, theatre. But then that definition also has its limitations um, because mathematics is often seen as an expression of the human mind. We don't find mathematics directly in nature, so it's really our uh, invention, although there are controversies on that. But mathematics is not always seen as part of the humanities. There are very, very few places in the world where where the mathematical part or the mathematical study is seen as part of the humanities. Basically, it's not. So here we have the, 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 the main problem. What are the humanities? And I said, may I, I thought by myself, maybe we need a more pragmatic approach by defining the humanities as the disciplines that are studied within the faculties of humanities in the world. And then we find, let's say, more disciplines than just these three that I mentioned previously. We can include, if you want to be inclusive, then we also include history which in some parts of the world is indeed seen as a social science again, but it's very often seen as part of the humanities in many parts of the world. I included also linguistics. And if you have a broad overview of this history of the humanities from antiquity, so that's important, from antiquity till today, uh, the study of the expressions of the human mind, from antiquity till today, then we certainly have to include the fields like linguistics, historiography, so history writing, philology, musicology, art theory or art history, uh, perhaps also logic, which can be, a, um, and perhaps also philosophy, but I'll come to, back to that later, uh, rhetoric, poetics. Poetics is a kind of forerunner of literary theory. So there may be more disciplines, but these disciplines um, uh, develop in the course of the later period. So I divided up my book into antiquity, uh, the Middle Ages, um, which is a bit an old-fashioned and Eurocentric term, so my, what might nowadays, uh, with hindsight, I might have better called it the post-classical period, perhaps, um, or the early modern era and the modern era. And um, 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 during those four periods, I investigated how uh, humanities researchers, or how, let's say, in general, scholars investigated this material uh, from, let's say, texts to music, to art, to uh, um, 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 language. So um, 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 I also decided to um, focus on the ongoing, uh, let's say, line, ongoing thread, where scholars have looked for certain uh, patterns, for certain regularities in their data. Had they wrote grammars, that's well known, the first uh, grammarians or uh, philologists tried to write grammars, not only in in, in ancient Greece, but also in, in India, even more than uh, in Greece and in China. And they tried to write, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, 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 treatises about art, which where they also search for patterns. But then I said, at the same time, if my ongoing uh, um, 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 thread in the history of the humanities is the search for patterns, I also have to carefully look for the um, attack on patterns, where people said, well, patterns are useless in the humanities. We have to search for exceptions, for anomalies. So I did these two kind of things. And this was my so-called limitation. One can approach the humanities in many, many ways. But I decided I start with these eight disciplines that I just mentioned. Then I want to describe how they developed into modern disciplines, like film studies, like media studies, which, of course, did not exist in antiquity. Film is an invention in the late 19th century. And I search for these uh, ongoing um, 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 uh, line of patterns and therefore also the underlying principles of theories. So that's a long answer to your question, but at least it gives, I hope, for the listeners an idea of what my book is about. Yeah. And, and before reading your book, I must say that I, I'm, I, I'm not from Europe myself, but I was sort of, I guess, because I studied English literature, I was also biased because when I opened the book and I started reading it, I was pleasantly surprised to see examples from... <laughs> Uh, from from the Islamic world, from Asia, 
because to to me when i said okay the new history of humanities i said all right it starts in antiquity it's very much a european center project a center project but it wasn't and as you mentioned you have kind of uh, broadened the horizon and you expanded this idea of humanities to um to disciplines that also you know d- disciplines and areas that also had really huge contributions and we'll get to some of them soon and uh, you mentioned eight fields that you have focused on in this one and uh Philosophy is left out, but you just mentioned it. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to know why you left philosophy out of these eight fields, or is it included in a part of them, maybe? It's, of course, it's implicitly there, like theology as well, by the way. It's implicitly everywhere. If you look at the index of the book, for example, philosophy is mentioned uh, dozens of times. But um, the absence of a history of the humanities as a field in general um, the absence of that uh, of such an approach did not mean that there was an absence of histories of philosophy. There were many histories of philosophy. These have been written for centuries already. What was really missing is these histories of these other disciplines brought together. Now, I, I fully admit that ideally it would have been lovely also to have philosophy always as a separate chapter in that book. The book would, of course, have been doubled because we have to remind we have to remember that philosophy was seen in many parts of the world as a kind of queen of the humanities that was actually the top for example indeed in europe but also in the arab or the islamic world um, one started with the uh, uh, liberal arts or as they were called in the um, islamic world in many places the studia or the uh, the adab disciplines and studia adabia which were basically very similar to the uh, uh, liberal arts and then after those humanities disciplines, one finally arrived either at philosophy or theology. So there were places in the world, at least the Islamic and the Europe and the, let's say the Christian world, where um, philosophy was already left out of the humanities. And also later on, uh, you see that the emancipation of the humanities disciplines meant that they wanted to emancipate themselves from philosophy and from the natural sciences. So there are perhaps reasons where you say, well, philosophy is a somewhat different area, but of course it's impossible to leave it entirely out. But I decided I want to emancipate especially those uh, disciplines that have been, let's say, um, historiographically forgotten. And certainly philosophy was not forgotten historiographically. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it makes sense because, you know, when when people read uh, uh, Plato or Aristotle, their works is also parts of their works is also considered poetic. I mean, like I said, about poetics, it's literary theory, and you have poetics there. Or uh, theology, the writings of Saint Augustine was considered philosophy, and it's theology. It's it's still kind of implied in your. You just book. mentioned yeah, Plato and Aristotle. Of course, uh, the work, uh, the, the poetical work, so the work on theoretical poetics by Aristotle is in the book. Or the the ideas of of, of Plato on on theater, which were quite negative, by the way, are also mentioned in the book. And there you can see that philosophy actually, in their time, meant also basically everything. <laughs> that, that was actually, actually at least the Greek conception. But we should remember, we should also remind that uh, ourselves that also the term philosophy is in itself also somewhat Eurocentric because it does not exist, for example, in Chinese. There you have notions of um, of, 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 of bien, which means uh, basically uh, rhetoric, so logical reasoning, you could also say, um, rhetor- rhetorical reasoning. It, it, uh, but the general term philosophy um, um, is also quite let's say, um, perhaps not Eurocentric, but certainly uh, Occidentocentric. Um, But coming very briefly back to, very briefly, if I may, um, to the term logic, because logic is included in the original eight disciplines that I start with. And that has also a very specific reason, because it was part almost everywhere as a kind of... um, fundamental study of the arts, of the six liberal arts, or seven liberal arts in, in Europe, the six liberal arts in China, uh, uh, Confucian arts, and logic was always there. It was a kind of fundamental part of, 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 of human, um, of, of yeah, the expressions of the human mind, as I started uh, my, uh, this talk with. Um, uh, let's talk about patterns. So you, in the book, you say that the, you discuss the meta patterns of humanistic disciplines. What do you, what do you mean by that? What are these patterns of uh, cyclical shifts that you discuss? And and one thing I found interesting is that throughout from antiquity to modern times, yeah, yes, yes, you talk this about descriptive humanities all the way, and then prescriptive, and then becoming descriptive again in modern times. Can you tell us about this? Yes, yes, I'd love to. So 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 as I said, I I, I search in my historical. In my historical research, I searched for this uh, ongoing um, 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 quest for patterns 
Um, although many of these humanity scholars do not use the term pattern themselves, some do, some do by the way, but they use different terms. They use um, um, uh, uh, rules, for example, in grammar rules, regola in, uh, in, in, in Latin, for example, it's very often used. They use terms, uh, it, indeed, like principles. Aristotle uses it a lot, but also um, the, 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 the Chinese um, uh, Mohist logicians use it. But these are patterns um, uh, that are searched for by these scholars themselves. I myself, as a, let's say, scholar, I could say meta-scholar that studies these other scholars, can also uh, attribute patterns to this long-term history of the humanities and to distinguish my the patterns that I found from the patterns that are found by the scholars, by the actors, the historical actors themselves, I use the term, I introduce the term meta-pattern. Well, I introduced it, it exists, of course, existed already. But I define that meta-pattern as a pattern that I attributed or that I found, there's a subtle difference here perhaps, but that I found myself in the material. And one of these meta-patterns that you mentioned just, and which I was very surprised about, is that many of the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, empirical patterns found by um, ancient scholars, just take Aristotle's uh, poetics, were um, descriptive. So Aristotle, we often think of these rules that Aristotle introduced um, are found for 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 good um, a Greek plays, that where he said it's more important to be, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, to find uh, plausible uh, 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 um, um, uh, narratives than than realistic narratives. Uh, things have to be plausible. Or every narrative needs to start with a beginning, uh, with a with a with a middle where there is the biggest tension, and then the end where there's some kind of catharsis. So he describes basically the Greek uh, plays, the Greek tragedies. These are how the tragedies at that time were made. He's descriptive, but after he created his descriptive rules, others after him, like for example the Roman um, um, uh, 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 um, Horace, Horace said, ah. We have to, now he becomes prescriptive, we have to follow these rules in order to create good pieces of texts or narratives or even theatre. So the descriptively found rules by Aristotle were immediately, or immediately, just a few generations later, were applied prescriptively, normatively by others. And this is a pattern that you see very often, also in the description of art by Pliny, which are then taken up by Vitruvius, for example, in a more prescriptive way. You see it in music. Um, you see it in basically all the all of the humanities in linguistics very much. Yeah? The original grammars were descriptive, many of them at least, and then they are used prescriptively. This is a general tendency, perhaps, of human beings, by the way, that description ends up being prescription, and it takes a long time, centuries often, before, at least in the history of the humanities, it has taken a long time before people realize. Wait a minute, we have perhaps become too prescriptively. Maybe we should go back to the original material and see that things also can be huh, come descriptively. This was, for example, also discovered by the Italian humanist uh, Alberti. Alberti found out that these very prescriptive Latin rules for, let's say, ancient Latin did not work out, of course, for his contemporary Italian, but Italian as a language, especially the Tuscan language, he was from Florence, the Tuscan language also that consisted of, consisted of many very interesting rules. And he approached this Tuscan dialect, it was not yet a language at this time, not an official language at least, he approached it again descriptively. So he found out that perhaps we should leave that prescriptive, that normative description, so to say, that normative approach behind us and start out descriptive again. So what I found is that there is a cycle, a very long durée, yeah, a very long-term cycle from descriptive humanities to prescriptive and then back to descriptive again that's one of these meta patterns that i found and it's interesting because you can only come across this conclusion by by analyzing how these separate disciplines have changed over time which is what you've done in the work in, in the book um we did mention it at the beginning i mean i mentioned it and you as well that uh you have you have not focused only on Europe. You have not restricted yourself to Europe only. And you have examples from, from India, from, from the Islamic world, from Asia. And I'm kind of curious to know, because you see more recent in humanities, and as I'm sure you're aware that there is this push or there is this urge to kind of decolonize humanities by focusing on minority writers or minorities or peripheries. Was it a conscious decision or... Or, I mean, I'm kind of curious to know why you decided to go beyond Europe. Well, I already knew this is a very, very, very important question. It, it, it was not immediately my, 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 my aim to, 
to join with the, let's say, uh, movement of colonizing the humanities, which perhaps when I started writing the book was not as prominent as it is now, but I did know already a little bit, of course, about the histories of the separate disciplines. So there was, although there was not so, such a movement as the history of musicology, the history of linguistics was a kind of separate sub-discipline. But as I said, in my book, I wanted to bring all these uh, histories together to see if there were interconnections. And I already knew, for example, that in the history of linguistics, the, the, the most prominent figure from antiquity was actually Panini. Panini, as the uh, stress has to be on the first syllable, was an Indian linguist, most probably living in the 5th, maybe in even the 6th century before Common Era. We don't know exactly when he lived. But his grammar, which consisted of almost 4,000 uh, rules, was immensely influential. It, 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 it was indeed studied by later uh, Persian um, 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 uh, scholars like Al-Biruni. Al-Biruni in his Indica or uh, Kitab al-Hind, uh, the book on, on India, um, uh, um, uh, even um, uh, spent a whole chapter on the study of Panini's uh, linguistics. It was translated into, uh, a part of it at least, was translated into, uh, uh, into Arabic. It was lying in some of the libraries in Toledo, um, in, 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 in Muslim Spain, uh, the, the, the Al-Andalus, in the already in the uh, from the 10th or 11th century 11th century onwards but it only became known in the 18th century in Europe uh, by William Jones who introduced it uh, uh, during a speech <clears throat> in Europe and then it became a success story it was studied by 19th century uh, uh, German linguists like Bob and they got all they all took elements from it so they not only got influenced by it but they said ah we also have to create this kind of complex phonological rules that we find in uh, Panini's work. So I was aware of this, what we call circulation of knowledge. And I thought, well, maybe there are more of these kind of circulations of knowledge, also not just from, let's say, India via the Islamic world to Europe, but also, let's say, between China and Africa. Or then I found out that there was a, an amazing uh, manuscript production in Timbuktu, uh, the great Timbuktu manuscripts of, of around half a million, perhaps even more manuscripts that are still lying there in personal libraries. Um, um, are just inc really amazing. There, you can find their books on musicology, on logic, on even on uh, the sciences like astronomy, but also lots on history. So there I said, we have at least do an effort to bring them together and see how they influenced or perhaps uh, had a contribution to other humanities fields. Uh, all, only later on I thought, well, wait a minute, this is also uh, contributing to this notion of decolonizing the humanities, where we try um, to, let's say, to provincialize Europe as a as a center of, of humanity studies. And I think that's very, very useful because indeed the humanities, the study of art, the study of language, of literature, are found really everywhere in the world. So why should we just focus on the West? We should actually try to describe these traditions um, um, on their own rights from all parts of the world. But this is extremely complex. So when I uh, told me that, when I told myself this has to be one of my goals, I immediately also contacted people um, um, that were actually Indologists, that were Arabists, that were Africanists, and that helped me, I thank them also in my book, by the way, that helped me with finding the relevant uh, literature and often secondary literature, because you have to be sure if you even consult translations that these translations are correct. It's not that I myself read and understand all these separate languages, but uh, some people have really done an amazing job by even tr translating for me some parts that had never been translated before. They, that was really fantastic. Uh, it was uh, fascinating that you mentioned uh, Panini. You said that we put the stress on the first syllable, right? I didn't know that anyhow. I first came, came across that name a few years ago. I was a TA in a course in Digital Humanities, and I read this book. And I think in an earlier communication, I told you that I read this book called Geek Supplying. And there was this computer programmer was talking about Panini and how his book is like a, I don't know, a, like a bl blueprint maybe for programming language and i out of curiosity i just picked up the book from the library the original book i don't remember what it was called maybe pan in his grammar it's a very small book 40 pages maybe because it's in sanskrit a series of rules how to which describes the grammar or how to generate the language and in that class i was teaching students so I decided to pick up the English translation as well. And I read somewhere that it's impossible to translate that unless you explain. You need to have notes upon notes upon notes describing it. So I showed the book to students, 40 pages, small pocket-sized book. And then I picked up the English translation, two big volumes, about 1,000 pages, translation and interpretation of that very, that small book. Um, and I'm, uh, you, you talk about Panini and also in Arabic. Uh, 
uh, author Sibawa, who's uh, who also had contributions to linguistics. Can you talk about these two figures a little bit more? How they're similar or different? And then later on, we'll talk about philology and how maybe their knowledge of grammar also flows into sciences. Oh yeah, wonderful. Sure, uh, Sibawai or Sibawai in, in, indeed was a Persian linguist. The, 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 they had most probably Sibawai did not know about Panini's work. So Panini's work is around 500 BCE. Sibawai lived in the eighth century Common Era, uh, let's say in the beginning of the of the what we call the Golden Era of uh, of, of Islamic, uh, 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 yeah, science and humanities. So Islamic knowledge, um, and. In a sense, they are the opposite. So Panini gives a set of a very complex, let's say, almost an algorithmic uh, set of rules. So that's why it's it's, it's very um, 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 uh, it has also been quite influential uh, uh, for uh, computer scientists because he starts with providing perhaps the first algorith- algorithms far before uh, the, the Arabic uh, uh, algorithmi. Uh, to which uh, the term algorithm has been attributed to. But um, he starts with a kind of set of rules that are extremely uh, uh, ordered. And if you follow those rules, you can decide for every possible sequence of words or even sounds, possible sequence of sounds in Sanskrit, whether that sequence is a correct grammatical sequence or not. Um, Whereas whereas the later um, 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 Arabic or Persian linguist uh, Zimbabwe gives a, a text... Um, um, 900 pages, also a very big text, uh, full of the intricacies and I should actually say full of the exceptions of the Arabic language. In fact, these two texts, so the first text by Panini is called the Ashta Yadi, which means the eight books. That text is meant for young Sanskrit speakers or at least Sanskrit readers to learn uh, the exact rules, the underlying rules of, of Sanskrit, but it's not meant for people that want to learn Sanskrit as a second language. The second book by Sibawai, or Sibawai, whatever you want to pronounce his name, um, um, is meant actually for learners of the Arabic language that are trained or that have a, a native language of another uh, uh, language. So, um, 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 for example, Persian speakers who wanted to read the uh, Quran um, used this book by Sibawai to go through all the various uh, exceptions or intricacies of the Arabic language. And the interesting thing now is that Sibawai gives one general uh, operator, it's not a rule, a kind of operator, uh, what he calls analogical substitution. Uh, and by this notion of analogy, he says you can create new sentences out of the, all the examples, uh, the examples of the exceptions uh, of the Arabic language. You can create new sentences by combining parts of um, of the examples that I gave in my book. Now, he mentions that very briefly, but he also gives examples where you can substitute just a word uh, in, from one sentence um, take uh, let's say if I say if I have two sentences that uh, the man walks on the street the woman walks on the street you could also say perhaps you could also create I, I, let's say the man walks on the street the woman uh, walks on the road you could also create a sentence the man walks on the road because they appear in a similar context that's the idea now you sometimes can also create ungrammatical sentences in this way so Siba Wai's text was not as formal certainly not as a Panini's text so these are different approaches but interestingly they also point out to two different traditions in the history of linguistics. One that focuses on regularities and strict rules, and the other one that, eh, Siba Wise, one that focuses more on, on constructions. And you also have nowadays still a very vivid community in linguistics that is called cons- the construction grammar compu- uh, community that is actually somewhat opposite to the more uh, Chomskyan, uh, by Noam Chomsky, Chomskyan approach that really focuses on finding the underlying deeper rules. And and it's impossible to talk about the humanities without talking about philology. Yeah, no, uh, I agree. Yeah. So can you tell us uh, wh- wh- what is philology? How do you define philology? And there's a very important character that you talk about in your book, Lorenzo Valla, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Valla. Yeah. Um, can you talk about philology and then tell us who Lorenzo Valla was? Yeah. Well, if you talk about philology, we should also go back to the uh, to the uh, establishment of the first library of Alexandria around the third century uh, BCE, um, where the Alexandrians, as they call it, the Alexandrian philologists, wanted to uh, reconstruct all classical texts uh, from Homer, Herodotus, uh, Hesiod, etc. They wanted to reconstruct all the original texts from the many extant copies, the many copies that they received from these texts. And these copies were often inconsistent, interestingly. We think about Homer as one text, but at the time when this library was created, they collected as many 
and they even uh, stole as many <laughs> possible uh, copies as, uh, as as they could. Um, and um, and then they discovered that hundreds, sometimes thousands, of texts were inconsistent, and they thought, how can we reconstruct uh, the original? Uh, 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 text as it was created by Homer. And they believed that that was possible, indeed. And that goal, uh, that aim, that beautiful uh, uh, goal, um, was also transmitted to later philologists. It was transmitted during the Middle Ages and um, um, also when we come to uh, the, the flowering of philology in uh, places um, like Italy, uh, like with Lorenzo Valla, but also other places in India, but I can come back later to that. Um, and Lorenzo Valla approached uh, um, uh, texts in a very critical way, similar to these uh, Alexandrians. So Valla was one of the early humanists of the 15th century. He wrote around 1440, 1445. And one of his most famous um, uh, uh, critical approaches to uh, text was a critical approach to the so-called um, donation of Constantine, uh, Donatio Constantini. He wrote it in uh, Neo-Latin. In Latin. And um, he also wanted to go back to the original source. And he found out that the so-called donation of Constantine, which I should say a little bit about before, this donation of Constantine was also, was, let's say, was always used, at least since almost a, a, a millennium already at his time, was always used as a kind of legitimization um, um, for the worldly power of the uh, uh, Catholic Church, of the Pope, you could say. And in that document, it was um, declared that Constantine, that's why it's called the donation of Constantine, that Constantine the Great, the Roman emperor of the early 4th century, that Constantine, in, to be exact, in 313, donated the entire West Roman Empire to the Pope. Um, um, and the East Roman Empire was then still kept for Constantine himself. So we know that he created Constantinople as his new uh, capital. And this document was used for centuries, um, as I said, almost a millennium, as the um, the, the uh, legitimization of the worldly power uh, of, um, of the Pope. And then it was actually um, 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 critically described by um, Lorenzo Valla, who wanted to go back to the original text, and he found out that the original texts, basically the, the earliest texts that we had from this document, were all written not in classical Latin, but in medieval Latin. This document could not have been written in the 4th century, uh, in the time of Constantine, but must have been written somewhere in the late 7th or perhaps even in the 8th century. It was full of terms like feudus, uh, that means the feudal system, which simply did not exist in the Roman Empire. It was invented later on, especially in France or late early medieval Italy as well, but especially in France, where you had this system of uh, feudal hierarchies uh, from the king all the way to the uh, to, 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 to the poor uh, farmers. Now, in this feudal system, if you have words like these, and it was full of kind of, of, of these kind of, uh, there were words referring to Jews that had, had nothing to do with the 4th century, Valla said, this document must have been a fake. It is a, uh, it is a, uh, and so he rebutted basically um, 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 this uh, document, showing that it was entirely, uh, impossible to be written in the 4th century uh, common era, after which, basically, he wrote a text on it, and it was, this is the most interesting part of the story, it was not immediately put on the so-called uh, index of the church, no, it was actually embraced by his, uh, by the Pope, by the then Pope, uh, Pius II, Pius II, yeah, uh, who was a humanist himself, by the way, he was, his actual name was Enea Piccolomoni, and he said, yeah, this document is correct, and then it stopped. He didn't do anything with it. So the Pope maintained his worldly power, and uh, the document was basically, you know, put aside. It was not put yet. It was not yet put on the index. This happened 150 years later during uh, the Reformation. But it was taken up. The results of that document, where he rebutted, uh, where Lorenzo Valla rebutted this uh, worldly power of the Pope, was taken up by uh, fierce uh, reformers like uh, Martin Luther, but also by uh, uh, Calvin by showing, wait a minute, here there is proof that uh, the worldly power of the uh, uh, Pope is fake. He should not have worldly power. He should only have, let's say, spiritual power. So it was used as actually a, a, a proof that uh, the Catholic Church was corrupted. And here we can have a beautiful example how an, a, a discovery in the humanities, a discovery in philology, really let's say, changed the world. We often forget about this, but certain humanistic discoveries literally have changed the world. And here's an example of it. it this is a fascinating example. Really, really fascinating. And, and can you tell us the definition of a systematic philology that, and also 
uh, this is not only something that we use in humanities, like the pattern similar to this also used in modern sciences. Can you give us some examples of that? Like genetics, for example? Yeah, that's true. It takes a long time, but remember that the way, um, not so much Vala, it, this has done be, be by later people. So uh, Vala created, or let's say, basically um, revived this notion of what we nowadays call a critical philology. Um, humanists, Italian humanists especially, directly after him, like Angelo Poliziano, um, um, the name is mentioned also in my book, he also created new rules. Uh, one of those rules of, is called the elimination, the eliminatio, or the elimination rule, by which he somehow put the many extant copies, the many surviving or transmitted copies, in a kind of genealogical tree, a stemma. That's what the stemma is, basically, a, a history tree. And by putting all these possible copies in a in a history tree, you can show which copies of text depend on other copies. So you put them literally in a kind of history tree of the history of the documents, so the history of how these different copies uh, depended on, on previous copies up to the uh, original text. So the goal is that by putting them into a stemma, you can actually derive the original text. And later philologists, and now I come even back to the 19th century, um, I even arrived to the 19th century, like Karl Lachmann, a German philologist, he also created a whole set of rules by which you, uh, some of these rules are called the deletion rule, the substitution rule, so by which you can substitute certain words by others so that you can actually show how text got corrupted. But he still used this kind of stemma, a genealogical, a genealogical tree, a history tree. Now, this method became so important that it became known as this as a new field in philology, stemma, eh, stematology or a stematological philology or stematic philology. And it became even taught at high schools, um, grammar schools especially. Um, it was part and parcel of um, the curriculum. It is still part of parcel of the curriculum if you study, let's say, classics or um, and other fields in the humanities. But at that time, it was studied even at high school. And interestingly, the earliest um, 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 uh, geneticists, um, who, at least to whom uh, we attribute the invention of uh, modern genetics, like uh, uh, let's first mention Rosalind Franklin, she's often forgotten, but also uh, uh, Francis and Crick, uh, the, the two guys who actually got the Nobel Prize for their in uh, discovery of the double uh, helix of uh, DNA and RNA structure. They found out that these notions of mutation, mutation in genetic strings, is very similar to mutation or corruption, we call it corruption in uh, in philology, how texts are transmitted or copied, because if you copy text, you make mistakes. And these mistakes, strangely enough, these copy mistakes that humans make have strong analogies and sometimes are even equivalent when mutations appear in uh, transmitting DNA strings in family. Uh, 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 and that's in family, let's say, resemblances, for example, <clears throat> or how even uh, certain um, uh, illnesses are transmitted. Um, so um, this discovery that there is a kind of analogy is once again a very beautiful um, interaction between uh, modern genetics and these modern uh, geneticists like Francis Crick and, uh, and Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, were trained at grammar schools. They knew about these methodologies and they said, ah, we can basically one-to-one -one apply these uh, rules of how uh, a, a strings of words get corrupted. But they use, instead of strings of words, they use strings of uh, uh, DNA sequences, or actually strings of nucleotides, nucleotides, maybe the word is. And, um, well, this is nowadays uh, well known in the history of science, but it's nice to, to emphasize that these methodologies, uh, how you can have put um, all kinds of um, strings into a history tree, came from stematic philology. And... Uh... So, so in a way, philology is a way of, let's say, determining the authenticity of sources. And in your book, you talk about uh, Zenodotus and also uh, Zeno of Citium, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, so which have, they, they had two different ways of, let's say, authenticating the validity of sources. Can you briefly talk about them as well? Yeah, so Zenodotus, Zenodotus is, uh, is one of the founders of the Alexandrian school of, of philology. I mentioned the Alexandrians already, right? And their goal was basically to find the original texts eh, from, from transmitted copies. Um, the school that we often see as an oppos in opposition, although the attribution of this opposition came from later Roman uh, philologists <clears throat> like Varro, um, um, that school is not so much looking for, let's say, finding the original text, but it's looking more for... <clears throat> just taking one text and try to interpret that text 
in all possible ways, in anthropological ways, uh, geographical, historical ways. And they claimed it's useless to try to find the original text. We never will be able to do that. We should not look for these analogies between texts, but we should look at anomalies, so the exceptions <coughs> of the singular text. And their school really produced, <coughs> um, so th these are called the anomalists of Pergamon, and they are often opposed to the an analogists of uh, Alexandria. Uh, they basically were contemporaries, second century BCE, <coughs> And the anomalist school really produced beautiful texts. Uh, there's a text of uh, Kratos of Malus, a uh, text by this Kratos of Malus, who basically wrote 60 chapters, or even he called them 60 books, on just 12 lines of the Iliad. <laughs> so it's, it's really, it really looks like uh, he gives a full set of interpretations why the ships uh, went to Troy, and etc. He gives all kinds of perspectives. It really looks like the modern, uh, uh, or modern, let's say, the, 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 you could even compare his work almost one-to-one -to, -one to the um, um, beautiful works by Roland Barthes, for example, in the 60s when he analyzes uh, a short story uh, uh, by Balzac in his book. Uh, it's a short story, and the book that he, where he analyzes this short story is, let's say, 10 times as big <laughs> as the original story. So yes, there is a, also what we can call a kind of an anomaly, anomalist tradition in philology that focuses not so much on this uh, uh, trying to find uh, the original text, but on the interpretation, so the hermeneutic uh, analysis of texts. And, and how, what was the role of philology in creating modernity? You did briefly talk about uh, talk about that, uh, but I'm particularly interested how it co sort of over through uh, Aristotle and paved the way for modernity. Yeah, so um, it's not only philology, by the way. So here I have to stress that, and I also explain that very carefully in, in my book, um, the contribution of early modern philology art theory, so art history perhaps you could call it, musicology and linguistics, was that they basically brought already in the early 15th century a very strong emphasis, uh, they brought about a very strong emphasis on empiricism, so an empirical approach to study music, uh, the, the underlying rules of uh, harmony for example, a uh, very strong approach on uh, um, 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 a very strong empirical approach on reconstructing the original text from uh, copies but also um, 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 the more empirical approach to describing a linear perspective in art. And you find that, by the way, not, again, not only in Europe, but also in China. I have to mention the name of uh, Gu Yangwu. Gu Yangwu is one of the important philologists of the early 17th century, where, in which, where, and he is also one of those philologists that tries to reconstruct, uh, let's say, the original text from copies, and he influences by that also fields like medicine and, and, and mechanics in, in China. But focusing for a moment on modernity then in, uh, in, in European philology, there you see that there is at a certain moment a direct interaction between philologists, musicologists and um, um, uh, linguists with the so-called new scientists. So if you take the case of Galileo, Galileo Galilei, his father was a musicologist, Vincenzo Galilei. They influenced, well, his father basically gave the empirical approach, the experimental approach, directly to Galileo. We know from Kepler, another example, another icon of the scientific revolution, from Kepler we know that he was also a philologist. He even talked, he even communicated with the great philologist uh, Scaliger, who was a French-Italian philologist working in the Leiden University, uh, Joseph Justus Scaliger, um, 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 on philological issues. And Kepler actually used this very empirical approach, also directly applying it to um, uh, the movement of planets, as we now know. So we see this interaction happening here. And what we then notice, and this is especially important, is that there was this kind of unity between the humanities and the sciences at that time, and they all were opposed to the classical approach to to, 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 to uh, let's say, the humanities and the sciences, especially, this was at that time the most famous philosopher and, and humanities scholar, you could say, Aristotle. And why they were so much opposed to Aristotle? Because Aristotle was also entirely incorporated by the then Catholic Church. It was a kind of what we would call nowadays a, pa a, a package, package deal. So the entire world view was based on a kind of geocentric um, 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 theory of the spheres, and Aristotle was the main towering figure. But if you look carefully at Aristotle, he was not always, in certain fields he was, but he was not always as empirical, as, let's say, um, 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 descriptive as we believe. So sometimes he was entirely prescriptive if he talked about 
um, let's say, uh, not not so much about ethics, but if he, when he talked about uh, certain fields, even in biology, but also um, his ideas about uh, uh, history, sometimes became very, let's say, normative. He started out from principles rather than directly from patterns, if I if we want to use my uh, terminology here. So yes, it was a kind of rebutting Aristotle. That was the main issue, in Europe at least. Uh, but in China, it was, for example, about rebutting Confucius, which was extremely dangerous as well. So if you make this comparison, Gu Yang Wu, it was often that people got you know critical about Confucius, who said things that were simply not you know valid empirically, and they run often they ran often into the same problems that they were let's say persecuted for being anti-Confucian. So to speak. And people here in Europe were persecuted because they were anti-Aristotle or anti indeed Catholic Church. Let's uh, talk about another field, histor- histor- historiography. So how was this con- How did this concept change over time from antiquity to modern? And I know I'm being terribly, terribly broad, because right? you, you mentioned several names. You mentioned, uh, <clears throat> let's say, Herodotus and also non-Europeans, people such as Manetho, if I'm pronouncing them correctly again. There is also the oral tradition in China. We have the Islamic historians, towering figures such as Ibn Khaldun or Al-Biruni. So maybe broadly you can talk about the field of historiography as well. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Sorry, I started a little bit reading here because that is, of course, an immense challenge. How can I could just in, in a few minutes, perhaps? I don't know how yeah, I much guess the idea is just to give our listeners a broad idea. How historiography actually developed as a field. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, there, there are many views on that as well. There are many uh, possible perspectives, so to say. If I choose one perspective, maybe I can, by, again, the way how historians have been looking for patterns in history, but this is just one possible uh, uh, way of looking at history, then we can make comparisons indeed. Huh? We see already, for example, in Herodotus's work that he found, or that you could also sometimes say that he attributed a pattern of um, a rise, peak, and fall of uh, states and empires. So he noticed, he noticed in his a huge uh, description or let's say history of the of the Persian wars uh, the, the, the wars between Persia and Greece that there was this kind of <clears throat> ongoing uh, uh, line where uh, certain states you know start by coming up uh, they rise in power then they they flourish and then they uh, decline again and this seems like a general natural rule but for him it was something new and he said it's not only this does not only happen with states but also with persons right so you have this you have famous uh, kings like Darius or like uh, even Alexander the Great where uh, which which actually uh, lived after uh, Herodotus, so this is not a good example. He did not use that example, but Darius he could he, he did use, where you know you, you come to a kind of rise, and then he he is also uh, uh, well, no, Darius also lived by the way. He's Hellenistic. He's Hellenistic king. Sorry, this was not a good example either, but he used names uh, of 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 uh, I think it was uh, King um, uh, the great king uh, the the great. Um, uh, 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 uh. Now, now, now I'm a little bit flabbergasted here, but anyway, the example is clear. We can find classical examples, and Darius is not the example used by Herodotus, but he used the example of of of, the, of, of King Midas. That's the name, yes. Um, where he, at the end of his life, he, he basically uh, got into trouble. So um, um, uh, you see, also not only in states, but also with persons, you see a rise, uh, peak, and decline. Now, interestingly, people in other fi- in other areas, and you mentioned <clears throat> Chinese uh, historiography. Um, and we can uh, mention here Sima Chen as an example, but also Banggu as an example. They described uh, the rises and fall of dynasties, of Chinese dynasty, of, for example, the, uh, uh, the earliest dynasty, the Qin dynasty, also called as the legalist dynasty, around, 1200, uh, around 200 uh, BCE, but also uh, the Han dynasty, which came immediately after that. So they were looking for rises and fall of dynasties. Now, interestingly, um, this was really an empirical pattern because the greatest um, 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 historian after Sima Chen, who I just mentioned, and indeed who also used oral sources in his big overview of the uh, of the uh, uh, Chinese uh, history, Bang Gu, the, the direct follower of, um, of of Sima Chen, found an exception. He claimed that in his dynasty, the Western Han dynasty, yes, the Western Han dynasty, there was no decline. Um, the Han dynasty would always flourish. Of course, we nowadays look upon um, uh, Banggu as a kind of ap- apologetic uh, uh, historian because he was serving directly the, the, the emperor of uh, the Western Han dynasty. So he basically claimed the Han dynasty will live on forever. But interestingly, if we compare these different approaches, 
um, in, into history. We also see um, in Europe, but also in India and other places, that people have also looked for exceptions to these patterns. So again, here we also see both the pattern searching and pattern rejecting. So one person who, for example, in, in, the, in, in Europe, searched for an exception to the pattern of rice peak and fall that was first described by Herodotus, as far as we know, was Polybius. And Polybius said, very similar to Bangu, by the way, um, but, but they didn't know each other at all, that the Roman Empire would live on forever. He also had an explanation for that, to which I won't go into right now. So he looked for an exception to this pattern. Of course, these historians were wrong. We also know that the Roman Empire declined yes, sooner or later. So in the end, Herodotus's pattern still seems to be valid. And interestingly, you see a recurrent um, reference to this pattern also in later historians. I can mention uh, Ibn Khaldun, who also describes this wonderful pattern of rise, peak and fall in the 13th, 14th century, uh, early 14th century, um, where he also describes that this is actually a kind of accumulating uh, pattern because new, let's say, even if a certain empire declines, uh, uh, the new rulers will take up the results of this previous empire, which he describes very nicely uh, for the North African um, history. Um, and also the history of uh, Al-Andalus, uh, the Spanish uh, Islamic uh, part. Now, it is taken up by later historians like uh, Giambattista Vico, the Neapolitan historian. It is even taken up by 19th century historians, by 20th century like uh, uh, Toynbee, uh, the great uh, British historian. So you find a continuity here in terms of the search for patterns. Now, this very short is a kind of very long durée overview if we look at history from a global perspective. Sorry for my mistake about Darius, and uh, but I oh, no, no. myself. <laughs> okay, but this is one way to view it. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you have talked about a lot of, let's say, similarities between humanities and how, humanities and science, and of course, we didn't really have anything like science. It's, it was a later invention. And how a lot of uh, contributions of humanities are also used in modern times, even in science. So I'm curious to know about this really, uh, this rupture between humanities and science, because there seems to be a culture war, especially in the United States. Um, in more or less capitalist countries, they're constantly defunding humanities because they think that um, studying humanities won't really lead to a job. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on this dichotomy between science and humanity. Do you see that as constructive or maybe it brings more harm than good? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, it's quite almost a kind of open question or open door here because we, indeed um, I, 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 I would strongly oppose this this, this somewhat artificial dichotomy. It's also quite recent, the dichotomy. It starts in the 19th century yeah, with the uh, German distinction between natural science, Naturwissenschaft, and um, um, the humanities, Geisteswissenschaft. It has to do with the emancipation of the humanities in the 19th century. So until the 19th century, the humanities had an enormous standing, indeed, and they were also continuously, uh, uh, there were cross-fertilizations between humanities and what we nowadays call the sciences. But in the 19th century, the natural sciences, or the study of nature, um, was definitely making enormous progress. Eh? So, uh, and especially, and this is the main point, also the humanities made progress in their eh, in their way of, uh, as I called, I mentioned earlier, the um, uh, systematic philology of 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 of, of Lachman made progress, which was later on uh, uh, taken up also by geneticists. But the natural sciences had an immediate um, 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 impact on technology, and this is something quite unique to the natural sciences, which we find much less in the humanities. So, very understandably. The humanities uh, in uh, in many places in the world um, uh, were put in a kind of defensive position. So, what is their use for technology? And then we find that there were these ph um, philosophers, like uh, I mentioned already earlier today, Wilhelm Dilthey, but also we have Wilhelm Windel Windelband. Many of them were German philosophers initially. Uh, Rickert, uh, Kassirer, they actually started to create. A, a, a very strong uh, particular identity uh, for the humanities. They said the humanities should not look for underlying rules, they should look for interpretations, they should look for understanding uh, historical actors rather than explaining. Explaining is something for the natural sciences, we should deal with understanding. Now this strong dichotomy, which was really created by humanities scholars themselves, were um, quite successful to, giving, to give the humanities a very specific identity, but they were actually harmful, really harmful, for the reputation of the humanities, because uh, the humanities were actually put in a kind of position that they were dealing with the interpretation of the world, not so much with explaining and changing the world. Now, if we look at actual practice in the humanities, 
in the late 19th and early 20th century, we see a very different thing. We see, as I already as also stressed in my book, we see approaches to finding, let's say, underlying patterns and principles in literature. Just take uh, Prop, Vladimir Prop, but also uh, people like uh, Claude Levi Strauss, who analyzes uh, narratives. Uh, we see uh, <clears throat> uh, the search for patterns in art, in music, in uh, language, etc. So there is much more unity with the sciences than people have often uh, claimed. Um, and these claims, coming from philosophy, sadly have been taken over also by politicians that say, well, wait a minute, there is this dichotomy, why should we uh, uh, still fund the humanities if the main discoveries and also the main applications are made, made in the sciences? Now, here there is a very big risk. Why? Because there is this continuous interaction between disciplines, uh, also among scientists. Scientists, biologists still take uh, inspiration from formal language theory, for example. And some of them also take, uh, for example, a medical scientist or medical biologist take inspiration even from literature. Uh, they nowadays have this field of uh, medical humanities, for example. It's very, very important. Um, so to make this distinction too strong is really detrimental for the field of, let's say, uh, knowledge in general. Sadly enough, we don't have a term for this in English, in the English language. We have to say for science and humanities together, right? Where, but in most other languages... Um, we have, let's let's say, in Dutch we have Wetenschap, in German we have Wissenschaft, and even in languages like um, 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 like Italian, where you have a very similar word for science, scienza, it still does include the humanities. But in English, this is kind of you know a dichotomy already in terminological uh, 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 in a terminolo- in a terminological sense, where you have to distinguish between science and humanities because humanities is not included in science. But definitely, it is dangerous to make this distinction too strong because. There is this continuous interaction between fields. Yeah. And, and um, I'll ask you a couple of other questions on that. Uh, I guess it was about a year ago I was talking to someone else. Uh, again, I, I kind of, it's kind of late at night. I'm forgetting all the names myself. The name of the book was uh, A Humanist Reason. And uh, Eric, Eric Hayot. Eric, Eric Hayot. Hayot, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I was talking, and I, I really loved the way the book started because he said that I was talking, there was this, he was in a conference, there was this economist who was talking about, you know, how cultures influence the expansion of technologies. And then he said, well, what you just said, we in humanities have talked about for 200 years. So why is it that what we have created is not really knowledge, but what goes through that scientific method is considered knowledge? So to, and, and that's something that humanities is usually accused of. But when reading your book, I see all those patterns. And you talked about, for example, an area person. I mean, you talk about this figure who talk in, in philology who works on the principle of elimination. They're very, very similar to scientific methods. So w- what do you th- think about this rigorousness of the knowledge that is produced by humanities? Uh, also, this is a wonderful question on, on which I could talk for another hour probably. Um, I'd like to stress that we should neither exaggerate to match the full rigorous method in the humanities. This is one of the methods. At the same time, we also have more, let's say, interpretative methods that are that start with this so-called hey, hermeneutic cycle, yeah, as is well known. The term uh, comes from the 19th century uh, uh, Schleiermacher, uh, 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 German uh, theologian, you could say, philologists as well. Um, where, where you try to uh, dive into a certain historical period and 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 look at at, at at similarities with your own periods, but then you try to even dive into further and and try to also uh, uh, learn the concepts of the period, and finally you get what 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 the late uh, Gadamer called this kind of verschmelzung der Horizonten, as he called it, the kind of uh, uniting the horizons of your field. But clearly, this is a kind of subjectivist method. It's not that you can really prove, if you uh, try to explain historical actors, you cannot really prove formally, rigorously, that these historical actors were really behaving as you believe that they were behaving. So the point here is you can always go back to the archives, to the original sources, but you can never... The hermeneutic method is not a a method that is used, let's say, in an entirely uh, rigorous way. But now comes this big surprise. When I figured out that there is, at least in the humanities, at least two strands, uh, the one of what, what I call pattern searching, which is, sounds very rigorous, and the one that I call more the pattern rejecting approach, that is more hermeneutic and interpretative, I also found out that this hermeneutic approach is not entirely inexistent in the sciences. 
Also, astrophysicists, for example, uh, uh, during the last two decades, have a very fierce discussion on the so-called anthropic principle. So they ask themselves continuously, why are the natural uh, constants, uh, the constant of, uh, of uh, or, or, for example, the gravitational constant of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, that is used in the, in the gravitational law of Newton, but also uh, 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 the, the Planck constant, why are they exactly uh, uh, in such a way that makes life possible on Earth? Now, as soon as even astrophysicists start talk, asking questions like how do we have to interpret these famous natural constants, the constants of nature, they become humanists, they become hermeneutic persons. And at the same time, we also must look at many of the sciences in a way that are um, viewed as historical sciences. So fields like geology talk about the history of the Earth. But just think about evolutionary theory in um in uh, biology, here again we see that they have embraced as early as the 19th century by, by Charles Darwin indeed in 1859, uh, the origin of species, literally embraces also there um, the notion of a history tree that actually also Darwin himself attributes to an earlier philologist, where you see that there is this, not only this strong interaction between science and humanities here, but again that there at the same time, not, uh, next to this hermeneutic approach in the humanities, you also had this very rigorous approach. But what I claim in my book, and I especially mentioned this at the end, is that the humanities is all of it. So what the humanities makes a little bit, I, I can't say unique, but what makes it really special, that it's not just this very, very objectivist, or one could call very, very uh, rigorous approach, but next to it, you also have this very hermeneutic, subjectivist approach. So the best thing we can do is not so much... Uh, take this for granted, but really embrace these two approaches as, a, as, as, as really characteristic of our field. Yeah. Mm. And, and I'm guessing you're positive also this of this new interdisciplinary research where people from humanities or sciences, like example you mentioned, medical humanities or digital humanities. Uh, the, and the reason I'm asking is that, again, I was talking to someone, a professor at Melbourne University, who was a little bit critical of cultural studies or film studies because he felt that in literature, the foundation of literature, English literature, is that philological research. And these new, let's say, disciplines are taking a lot of energy from, uh, from, from English discipline, at least from the English discipline. Or that that that's a, a serious risk. I also met, remember once a conference, um, um, what was it in Copenhagen, where people said, "No, but what humanists really want is, to, you know, to 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 search into manuscripts and to deal with to, to to work in the archives." But you know, the humanities are changing. Also, this is a very somewhat um, nostalgic view of the humanities. So yes, yes, sure, new fields like cultural studies or digital humanities may take time away or even energy away from the older fields. But we could also say, well. We, the humanities are growing, they're changing. Um, so new fields, like also environmental humanities, for example, this is an upcoming new field. Um, we should not uh, view this as... as uh, it's quite normal that, that, let's say, the older humanists that are still alive view these kind of new fields with some kind of uh, suspicion. But we should also remember that they bring a lot of new energy at the same time. So thanks to fields like digital humanities, I know I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted uh, perhaps here, but new fields like digital humanities um, um, have also raised new questions. Thanks to this field, we can now find, find, we found out that there are, for example, direct, not direct, but we have found out, for example, a paper trail uh, uh, automatically almost between people like uh, 19th century uh, historians and 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 the 17th century historian Vico, and uh, that before was almost impossible to find out because there were too many uh, uh, search spaces, and now we can do this semi-automatically. So yes, there is this beautiful interaction, but we should be wary of one thing. Often, if we look at interactions between science and humanities, it is said yes because the humanities should also try to apply these more empirical methods of the sciences. But then it's often forgotten that these empirical methods were actually first invented in the humanities, in the 15th century uh, humanist tradition, not only in Europe, but also in other uh, regions in the world, where people started to look afresh at art, at music, at language, at texts, and they created the empirical method, which was actually taken over by the natural scientists in the 16th century. So we should actually be proud of uh, the empirical, of our empirical approach in the humanities and fully appropriate it and also just rightly appropriate it. It is our method, and it has become a general method. Maybe that's also a good 
um, uh, statement to <laughs> almost finish this uh, uh, interview with, I would say. But that's up okay, to you so, if you want to finish. It. Well, yeah, I guess I, 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 that, that was my last question. So I guess it's a great note to finish the interview. And I myself, I must say that I myself really, really enjoyed I did a PhD in English literature, but reading this book really, really changed my perspective about humanities because I'm always kind of buried into English literature but knowing about the history of the field is also important like any scientist you should know the history and philosophy of science so this book really really changed my um my my my, my view towards uh humanities and I'm sure our listeners uh will enjoy if they've enjoyed this great podcast I've personally immensely enjoyed this conversation I'm sure they will enjoy reading the book and uh Maybe you also want to, before I say goodbye, you want also to introduce the latest book you worked on, and I have secured a promise from you to get in touch with you soon to talk about that book in the in new in new books network as well. So maybe briefly, just want to name that book because it's a sort of a sequel to this book that you've written. Yeah, so so the, so so the latest book that I that I published just earlier this year, no, not this year, last year, two thousand twenty two, with Johns Hopkins University Press, is called World of Patterns. Uh, a global history of knowledge, where I actually want to extend uh, my field of uh, histor- historical uh, uh, research, not just to the humanistic disciplines, but also to the social and especially the um, um, uh, natural science disciplines, but also including fields like medicine and even uh, legal studies, where you can also find the search for patterns and principles. And um, But I must stress also that after I finished that book, I said I felt into a deep a deep uh, hole, I could you could say. I said, well, what now? I now approach the history of knowledge. So recently I'm now working on finalizing a book on, on trying to, again, using still the approach of searching for patterns and principles. But right now I'm working, or basically I'm finalizing it just uh, uh, these months, on working on a, a global history of um, 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 uh, giving sense to life. Uh, there's a beautiful word for it in Dutch and German and other Germanic languages. It says Sinngebung. There's just one word, which means yeah, giving sense, uh, making sense of life. And also there we can again compare all different countries, all different cultures in the world, how people, not just by means of religion, they're even uh, using scientific approaches, even using uh, searching for, for beauty, searching for uh, justice, but how do people in different parts of the world uh, 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 search for meaning, so to say? That's uh, the next step. Um, 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 uh, just talking about ridiculous megalomanic ideas. I fully agree <laughs> that this is perhaps too uh, too broad so a field, but so we have to try it. I think we need to try podcast with you soon this year, hopefully. <laughs> oh, <wow. Thanks. laughs> yeah. uh, Professor Renz Bard, thank you very much for your time and for thank talking uh, with us on New Books Network. It was my pleasure.